Hello, theology nerds. This is Trip, and you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Theology for the People. That is a publishing work that Fortress Press is doing. Publishing, did you guess it? Theology for the People. And our friends at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Check them out. PTSTulsa.edu. PTSTulsa.edu. That is a website. And Phillips is a longtime friend of the podcast. They help sponsor this live podcast experience in Atlanta, Georgia, during the American Academy of Religion. And uh, they just want you to know, do you like theological ruckus? Do you want to have faithful, critical, and progressive encounters and experiences with Christianity? And do you want to lead them? Then think about going there, getting your education. They have tons of financial support. They have tons of different ways you can get the degrees. And they have like from MDivs to Masters in Social Justice to Demons. Check it out, ptstulsa.edu. And when you do, tell them the homebrewed Christianity sent you. Booyah! Boom! Now, let me tell you what's about to happen. You're about to hear a live podcast from AAR. And you may be saying to yourself, Trip didn't last year. Last year, you had on John Cobb, John Caputo, and just Catherine Keller at AAR, the American Academy of Religion. How in the world would you even consider having another podcast there? You kind of have maxed out. What did you do? Did Jesus come back and you interview him? I said, no, no, no. Jesus didn't come back. But um, it was Jürgen Moltmann. <laughs> Jürgen Moltmann. If you don't know who he is, then let me just tell you in advance that this is a podcast celebrating the 40th anniversary edition of his book, The Crucified God. And I mean, the man has wrote multiple like theological field shifting books, but this one is like one of the most powerful books ever written. It'll move you, it'll grab you. Those of you that are part of the homebrew community know we have been reading and engaging The Crucified God the last couple months. Um, and uh, if you're if you're interested in that, check out uh, homebrewedcommunity.com. But uh, we've been reading and working through it, and it's it's such a powerful book. It dramatically transformed the theological landscape. Miroslav Volf said, Miroslav Volf, you should listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. He said, I know of no theologian from the second half of the 20th century who has had as powerful a global resonance as Moltmann. So um, that's who's that's who's going to be on the podcast, and in it. Um, we talk about this book. We talk about how it's been received. We talk about all sorts of things. Uh, and the book, Moltmann, basically is saying, like, look, suffering's not a problem to be solved theologically. Instead, it's actually an aspect of God's very being. Like, if God is love, it involves suffering. And the crucifixion is the way that uh, Moltmann opens up the suffering uh, into the very heart of God, into the Trinity. Um, so the crucified God is not just a hip title. It's also a very, very powerful uh, theological idea. Um, again, this is recorded live in Atlanta, and Moltmann talks soft. So we had to do some very, very special audio work to uh, make sure you can hear everything he says. I am joined by uh, the elder, Tony Jones, throughout the conversation. Um, and then we're joined by Jennifer McBride, uh, and she and Moltmann discuss... Um, uh, Kelly, uh, who was, who was executed uh, by the state of Georgia, the friendship she developed with Moltmann, the challenge to the death penalty and to sparing her life. And, and that story is very passionate. I want you all to know when you hear it, like you're like trip, you should talk more to Jennifer done. We're going to be recording an episode, uh, soon. Uh, we got to hang out after she's awesome. Going to come back on the podcast. Then, uh, Philip Clayton joins for the most legendary and epic toast of a theology type I've ever heard. It's half in German, half in English. Um, it's entertaining both ways, whether you know German or not. Uh, but if you do, you'll giggle twice as much. And I just want you to know, like, I was sitting next to Moltmann as he was doing this, and Moltmann was, like, trying to decide if he should uh, breathe or laugh because it was he was laughing that hard and enjoyed it. Uh, it, was a, it was really a dream come true to get to interview Moltmann at the podcast. Uh, I loved it. Thanks to Fortress and Theology for the People and Phillips Seminary for sponsoring it. And uh, <clears throat> the other thing we did at it is to celebrate um, the 40th anniversary of his book and the release of mine, 
the homebrewed Christianity guide to Jesus, Lord, liar, lunatic, or just freaking awesome. Um, if you haven't got the book, then you should get it. And when you do, forward me a receipt to bonus at tripfuller.com, bonus at tripfuller.com. And uh, if, if you do it, and in the in the memo of the receipt, say, hook me up with that Moltmann, then I'm going to send you an introduction to Jürgen Moltmann uh, and a walk through the crucified God, Jürgen Moltmann audio, a little gift for uh, ordering the book. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, if you, if you stay until after the interview, I'm going to tell you about a sweet deal I'm doing this Christmas. It's called Give the Gift of Jesus this Christmas. So if you're thinking about giving my book to your friends, your family, your favorite fundamentalist, then stay till after, and I'll tell you about a sweet way you can get like hundreds of dollars worth of theology books and join for free an online book group about my book. And you could join it with your church, uh, your church reading group, pub group, by yourself, with your favorite fundamentalist. You give the book to all sorts of things. Anyway, details after the interview. Um, so yeah, Jurgen Moltmann on the podcast. And uh, yeah. Oh, after after the interview, I'll tell you also that I got to see like members from The Walking Dead at the podcast that night. I'm going to tell you that story after it. But first, you're about to get your theological brain. Blah, 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 blah. See, I'm so excited. I can't even talk. Your theological brain. Yeah, your theological brain's about to get eschatologically ruptured. Mm -hmm. All right, here it is. Welcome to Homebrewed Christianity Podcast Live at the AAR, where the, yeah. there's never been, it's, it's like uh, the most Isley of nerds. <laughs> I'm excited about the new Star Wars movie. Anyway, um, just think, like, I've already gotten 30 tweets of people that are still trying to figure out how to get here. They're going to get here and they're going to be like, oh, did Moltmann say anything? So when they come in, start crying. Like, and they're like, how was it? And you're like, oh my, it's, it's, Jesus just was born in my heart right now. Anyway, uh, uh, Homebrew Christianity Podcast started in 2008. Each month, there's like 50,000 unique people at least listen to me talk to someone for an hour about God. And they're like super nerdy. And the metaphor behind it is basically that a craft beer and homebrew is making a revival because people discovered that beer could actually have flavor. Now, Europeans have always known that's the case, but Americans, man, they invented PBR, Paps Blue Ribbon. It was an award winner in 1902. <laughs> and if your theology hasn't changed since 1902, it too might be tasteless and only works in large portions when held upside down in a frat house. Uh, so... I, uh, I started a podcast and said, I want to give people ingredients to brew their own faith, to homebrew it so it's tasty and zesty and awesome. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a, a couple ingredients I've spent since 2008 trying to have on the podcast, and one would be Jurgen Moltmann and the other's the Pope. Uh, those are my two wish lists. So if Protestantism had a Pope, like someone who was so theologically badass that everyone should have to agree with them, and you should chuck the two nature doctrine, put suffering in the heart of the Trinity, and social Trinitarian that junk all over the place, then it should be Jurgen Moltmann. But luckily, we don't have a pope, so we're just going to talk to him about like the most influential book in the tw second half of the 20th century. It happens. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you all for being here. And this is my friend Tony, who will be riding uh, a shotgun. Non-violently. Yeah. Tony. Hey, everybody. Hey, we got a couple awesome sponsors tonight. The first sponsor is my employer, Fortress Press. Fortress Press is here for Fortress Press. <laughs> Woohoo! Fortress That's Press right. has recently published the 40th anniversary edition of The Crucified God, a book that changed. Just round of applause if this book changed your life. All right, there we go, everybody in the room. I wrote the back cover copy of the 40th anniversary edition. Thank you very much. Yes, I did. Is it, is it weird that that back of the book will sell more than all the other books you wrote combined? <laughs> at least, you never listen to the podcast. I'm, at least I'm somehow attached to a bestseller. <laughs> Miroslav Wolf wrote a foreword for the 40th anniversary edition, and it's for that reason that we are uh, gathered here tonight to talk about this book, 
uh, 40 years on. Full, I mean, we're also at Fortress thrilled and proud to be the partners with Trip in the Homebrewed Christianity Guide series. Trip is the author of the inaugural book in that series, The Homebrewed Christianity Guide to Jesus. And I support him. And Trip Fuller will be signing books after the podcast tonight, right down the hall, buy his book. And have him sign it for you. If or, you or your mom or dad, it's Thanksgiving. Buy multiple copies. Up. If you're a religion student, they may wonder whether or not you're still a Christian. Bring them home a book that's like on the subtitle says Jesus is awesome. Yeah, Jesus is on the cover. <laughs> if if you you can buy this book tonight too. If you want this book to be signed, come to the Fortress Press booth in the exhibit hall at AARSBL. Between 11.30 and 12.30 on Sunday, midday on Sunday, bring this book and uh, Dr. Moltmann will sign it for you. And if you would like a chance to win a free copy of this book, a free signed copy, take a selfie with your vintage copy of The Crucified God full of, full of highlights, multiple highlights. Who's has multiple highlights in The Crucified God? Paper clips marking the important pages. Take a selfie with that. Hashtag Moltmon40 on Instagram, tw- Twitter, Facebook, and you will be entered into a, con- a contest to win not only this book, but I think like three, three Fortress Press Moltmon books. So that's all going on. Hashtag Moltmon40. Okay? We've got another yeah. sponsor. Oh, Phillips Theological Seminary. And, you know, not only is Tulsa the coolest city in Oklahoma, but Philip, I'm glad we agree. I love to. My wife just went to Tulsa to shoot uh, uh, some restaurants for, I mean, she doesn't shoot them. <laughs> I shoot things. She shoots things. You know what I'm saying? And she came back and she's like, Tulsa is such a hipster town. Like, Tulsa is full of hipsters, great restaurants, Dude, music. I went a couple weeks mixologists. ago. Mixologists. I cried during the Woody Guthrie Museum. Oh, yeah. You would. Yeah. No, it no, it's a really good museum. And then like it's like half Woody Guthrie and then the influence of Woody Guthrie to protest folk music. And so like every little bit of live on the beach in California just erupts in your heart and you're like, Yeah, we should give peace a chance. Okay. So Phillips, uh thanks so much to Phillips. And you can do uh at Phillips you can do a full M div sitting in your mom's basement. But everyone has goals in life. Um <laughs> Anyway, Phillips. You don't have to move to Tulsa, even though it's a, the, the hipster capital of Oklahoma. You don't have to move there to get a an MDiv from there. And when I did the uh, book release party a couple weeks ago in Tulsa, they have like a, a hundred beer tap place downtown that uh, that actually had uh, you know hoppy beer that was good enough. It could have been from California. Mm. There we go. Usually, I judge flyover IPAs. Now. Trip, you told me um, before the podcast that one of your mentors, John Cobb, that this I think is maybe a fitting introduction to ah, Professor John. Moltmann. John Cobb said something about Dr. Moltmann that I think would be a fitting introduction as Pastor Mark Buchanan escorts Dr. Moltmann up here onto the stage. Well, Let's last last year, uh, John Cobb and Catherine Keller were at the – and Jack Caputo were at the Fortress Homebrewed Live Show. And uh, when I told uh, John, who who I was interviewing this time, he said, Moltmann, Moltmann, Moltmann is the most beautiful, intelligent, and critical theologian who joyfully lives in the Christian tradition. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's hear it for Dr. Molman, everybody. All right, Tony. I know we were we went back and forth arguing over who was going to ask the first question, and you kind of were like, "Did I win?" Uh, yeah, because you're like, "I edited your book. You better let me talk first. I did edit your book. That's a whole other podcast episode. We'll talk about that. When forty years ago, when the Crucified God came out, um, it you know, caused quite a stir. And I'm just wondering, you know, a lot of us, uh, I was seven years old at the time. And so I'm not, I can't say that I'm, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the environment of theology was, but 
as you were writing this book, were you having moments where you thought, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something that may or may not be embraced by my, by my theological colleagues? Was that something on your mind? What do you think about the environment into which you were writing this? Um, I had uh, a theology of the cross always on my heart. Uh, but the occasion was April of 1968. We had a national uh, wide conference on the theology of hope at Duke University and uh, the second day Harvey Cox stormed into the room and cried Martin King is shot Hmm. and uh, when I said goodbye to my American friends I promised them when I ever I return, I will no uh, word say about the theology of hope, but but about the crucified God and the crucified hope uh, with the murder of Martin Luther King. Mm. Uh, a hope for America was shot. Mm. And this was the occasion to write the mm-hmm. crucified God. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you to just sneak your chair up a little bit closer yeah. to that microphone. Um, you, uh, you know, the Theology of Hope, which was the book that preceded this, yeah. had caused quite a stir. And you had attempted, I think, you were attempting, or you were doing something that's, that really no one had done, and that was you took some of the most potent and at that point really nascent voices of liberation theology and brought them into a more mainstream kind of traditional German systematic theological framework. And was that, at the time, was that frowned upon by your colleagues? Was that embraced by your colleagues? What was the initial reception to you kind of bringing these new strains of theology into the traditional German framework? Well, after the theology of hope, I developed with my friend, uh, the Catholic theologian, uh, Baptist Metz, a political theology, a theology with a face to the world, Mm. uh, not only to the face of uh, the church. He didn't want to preach to the choir, Hmm. but on the marketplace to the world. And uh, by this, the connection with liberation theology and the theology of revolution from Latin America came up. Uh, so it did not develop out of the theology of hope and not out of the crucified God, but out of the uh, new political theology. Mm-hmm. We wanted theology to be involved in the politics of justice and righteousness and liberation on earth. But um, I experienced something um, very unique with the crucified God Uh, when uh, the six Jesuit fathers were killed in El Salvador. uh, McAfee Brown wrote a letter to me and uh, told the following story. Uh, They killed uh, Ramon Moreno and uh, pulled uh, his uh, 
body into the room of Jon Sobrino. And uh, by chance, a book fell out of the bookshelf and uh, was drained with the blood of the martyr, Rama Moreno. And it was my book on Dio Crucificado. And I made my pilgrimage two years after uh, to El Salvador and found the book on a glass uh, as a sign what really happened there in that night. Mm-hmm. One of the things I've uh, seen just in getting the chance to actually teach the text is that for people that are younger who weren't, uh, who don't have m- personal memories of, of of World War II, of the existential questions raised by Auschwitz, um, and, and that kind of thing, it's hard to introduce uh, the historical situation and the question or problem God raises uh, with the intensity it did in the 20th century. So I'm interested in how, looking back, you see the question and problem of God uh, um, uh, phrased or turned uh, when looking back at the, the text, you know, 40 years later. If you are speaking out of your own experience, you are understood everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you are speaking in abstract terms, uh, you will find no understanding. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm still getting letters from prisoners or uh, people with a deep sorrow and uh, everybody can uh, overcome by sorrow mm-hmm. and uh, anxiety. And uh, this w- was not my intention. Uh, I dealt with my problem mm-hmm. with God and my suffering and my feeling of forsakenness. Uh, it happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, in the book, you kind of uh, you bring to the fore the pathos of God in Scripture. Yeah. Uh, can you describe like how you how, how that theme came to your imagination and how it impacted uh, the kind of ignorance of the Christian tradition towards that kind of living, life-giving, engaged, passionate God in Scripture? Well, if you read the Old Testament, you get the impression that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is a passionate God, a passionate in his love and in his wrath. And uh, his grace is uh, much stronger than his wrath. And uh, when uh, Christianity entered into the Greek and Roman world, uh, the theologians read Aristotle. Uh, For Aristotle, the absolute, the divinity, is apathes, apathetic. Uh, which is a, in antique terms a uh, expression for sovereignty but for modern expressions apathy is a sickness mm-hmm. uh, you lose any interest in life become apathetic uh, life and death is the same for you and uh, uh, so we cannot speak of an apathetic God mm-hmm. you, you, write in, you write in this book that um, apathy is the major ailment of humankind you, says, you say this in the 20th century yeah 
And yet we, we follow this God of passion and pathos, but we're, do you think that's something endemic to the human condition? Or do you think that's, I know you've been thinking recently, like in your most recent book about the, the modern situation, the 21st century technological situation. The, 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 uh, there's been a lot of talk at this conference over the last couple of years about Charles Taylor uh, writing about how we just live in this world of pure imminence and the transcendent seems less and less believable every year. Do, yeah. do you continue, like looking back now, 40 years later, you, when you pin apathy on hum, humankind as the biggest malady, is that something you still worry about in humanity, is apathy? Yes. Uh, arrogance is a temptation of the powerful. Apathy is a temptation of the powerless. Mm. And uh, to bring people out of apathy uh, that they feel pain and uh, compassion uh, it's uh, the task of a good preacher mm -hmm. <laughs> now th as, as you know I mean you, you spent a lot of time in the global south when, when the theology of hope and when this book yeah. was coming out and the rest of your career of course and as you know it in, in much of the world, as opposed to a theology that says part of life is embracing suffering and that God suffers along with us, instead, there's a theology that is ascendant that says you, God doesn't want you to have any pain or any suffering. You can in, insulate yourself from all that if you do these certain things. And I wonder if you have reflection on how those, I don't know, what, what 40 years on, uh, those of us who are younger and take up this mantle of the crucified God can do to preach that better? Well, for my impression, uh, it starts with the love of life. Mm. Uh, if you love life, you can feel uh, the happiness of life but you can feel also the pains of life and the disappointments. If you uh, take the love of life back to yourself, you feel neither pain nor happiness. And uh, in our fun society, uh, people don't feel pain and joy. Mm. They want to have their fun. Mm -hmm. Can you can you say a bit about the eschatological shape of of, of Christian thought? Uh, I mean, a, a lot of times people go, "Oh, Moltmann's an eschatological theologian," or "Moltmann's a theologian of the cross." Uh, but one of the most powerful uh, parts of the book, to me, is how the eschatological shape of Christian theology uh, transcends kind of both the modernist debate around theism and atheism, but also around uh, the historical Jesus or the, the dogmatic Christ, that the eschatological shape of Christian theology is this kind of third space to then tackle uh, so many questions. Um, so how would you describe... Uh, the the eschatological shape of Christian theology. The eschatological event in this world of violence and death is the coming of Christ into this world mm. and the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Uh, and uh, so we start with the resurrection and. Uh, look forward to the transformation of this world into the new world of uh, resonance and harmony. Uh, and uh, so eschatological thinking is not uh, thinking about a far distant future, but to return to the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then you feel the spirit 
to stand up against violence and injustice mm -hmm. and uh, to overcome your own apathy. So, so what's the, the critique of just generic monotheism? Uh, one of the things that struck me a couple weeks ago in teaching uh, the book, and this was a student that asked it, uh, they said, uh, one of the things Moltmann does is make me think the Trinity is like really super important for Christianity yeah. and that the cross and resurrection is not just like the way we tell the story, but like the real deal, you know? And, yeah. and, and he said, it's like, he hears people debate about God, like, oh, I'm a theist, I'm an atheist, and they're having this fight. Uh, and Moltmann goes, well, that's just a boring, bad, poorly formed question. Let's talk about the cross. Uh, so yeah. Can you describe how Christians, in talking about God, reframe this debate of just generic deity versus complete rejection of all deities? Well, we had a debate uh, with the communists on uh, monotheism and atheism. And uh, I, I don't understand why monas is a new name of God. <laughs> <laughs> You've had like 10 tweetable lines so far. I hope someone is... Like, your job is to tweet those things. Like... He, he might be in his 80s, but he, but he has tweetable lines like he's 22. <laughs> Evergreen theology. Yeah. And we found uh, among the communist thinkers, atheists for God's sake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As my friend Ernst Bloch answered my question, why are you an atheist? And she said, I'm a, a atheist for God's sake. Mm -hmm. And we don't believe in the false gods and uh, uh, etc. And uh, early Christians were accused in the Roman Empire of atheism because they refused to adore the Caesar as a god. So atheism is uh, sometimes good. <laughs> <laughs> Just if you're a youth minister, you probably yeah. shouldn't say that to your teens. Not at not. And as long as your support of health not, insurance. Not at your not at your annual parent meeting. Yeah. You're like, ah, well, don't worry, kids. <laughs> Tripp and I have both spent significant years as in working, doing ministry with youth, with yeah, adolescents yeah, and yeah. young adults. And, you know, one of the things that uh, children are taught is that, um, you know, Jesus died for your sins, but then they're also taught Jesus is God's son, and then they're also taught, well, Jesus is God. And, you know, children uh, maybe don't have any problem with these but then they come to adolescence and they come into the youth ministry and they ask how does that exactly work you i my sunday school teacher taught me that jesus is god but also that jesus is god's son but then also that jesus had to die for our sins so god could let us into heaven and to, to th this book of course in a very complex and sophisticated way answers that question but how do you think you might, to a, to a 16-year-old who's coming to terms with these different ways that people talk about God that seem to be in conflict, how, how do you reconcile those? I think it's one-sided to talk about Jesus died for our sins. Uh, he died in solidarity with the victims of injustice and uh, death penalty mm. Mm -hmm. and uh, every uh, compassionate young person will understand this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I remember the first time I read uh, the, um, the second Christology was any theologian decides to write additional lines to the creed 
um, I figure is pretty hardcore. And, um, and when in, in, in the book you suggest adding in to the creed, the yeah. description yeah. of Jesus's ministry and the, the, the life and presence and power of the kingdom of God, uh, I've told that story a bunch of times when doing confirmation because, uh, I've encountered students, uh, high school, college students who see this dichotomy between the gospel as performed and discussed in the church and then like, this radical, revolutionary, beautiful, eschatological, rupturing, deep love story of the Gospels. And that, why do you think the church needed the reintroduction of the story that's in four of the books in its New Testament? Isn't it weird? Like, like, like what is it that we slide into that makes us need to have the Gospel story and life of Jesus reintroduced? To feel communion with Jesus, and uh, in the creed uh, between born and suffered, uh, there's just one comma, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, this is a, a reduction of the life of Jesus. He was baptized and uh, preached the gospel and healed the sick and. Uh, uh, was the redemptor of Israel and uh, you cannot reduce this in a dogmatic term. Mm-hmm. The, the tr- traditional um, theologies of the atonement to oversimplify can be broken into two categories, the objective versions of the atonement and uh-huh. the subjective versions of the atonement. Yeah. The objective versions where there's some kind of cosmic transaction that takes place that's, uh, that, that's all about God. God's wrath being satisfied. And then the subjective versions in which something happens within us when we are confronted with the crucified Christ. And it seems to me, this isn't so much a question, but I'll, I'll lead with a question. I mean, I'll end with a question. But it seems to me... That your that crucified God combines both because something happens in the Godhead. Yes. Right? And something also happens with us. Yeah. With us. So maybe you can reflect on that, that how you avoided and, falling into those two categories and how this what this means in the Godhead and in us when when Jesus dies on the cross. And also something happened with the others. Oh. Uh, I remember uh, it was a a special hour in the German parliament during the Cold War when uh, a famous Protestant minister, Gustav Heinemann, stood up and made a speech and he was saying, Christ is not against the communists. And uh, the Christians protested against it. And he continued, he died for them. And there was a silence in the parliament. So today we should say, Christ is not against the Muslims. He died for them. And we should accept Muslims as a persons for whom Christ died. Mm, mm, mm. As a, this is not to accept the Islam and uh, the Quran, etc., but uh, meet the person with respect as a potential sister and brother of Christ. You 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 say that God God's pathos God's passion for all creation was exemplified in this event of the crucifixion. Would you go so far as to say that God experienced something that God had not previously known in the death of Jesus? Was that a was that a new a new learning or a new experience for God? That solid that moment of solidarity with human suffering. Yeah. I remember 
Alfred Noss, Whitehead, the process mm. philosopher, Amen. Uh, wrote uh, when his only son died in a car accident, mm -hmm. God is a fellow sufferer who understands. And he meant not Christ, but the father of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And do you think that God had that experience as a fellow sufferer prior to the crucifixion, or did the crucifixion open a new window of solidarity with humanity that previously God had not experienced? This, this is a somewhat speculative. Indeed, question. indeed. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I think it's, it is implied in the mercy of God. Mm. Mm. He is prepared to do so. Mm. Mm. When, I, when I was talking to a, a, a process Jewish theologian uh, the other day, and I was like, <coughs> he said, you know, Moltmann is my favorite Christian theologian. And I said, why? Uh, well, he introduced a theology of exile to all the Gentiles through the cross. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I asked, and I asked, when I was writing my book, which is a very, like, a popularized Moldmanian uh, atonement theory. All the good parts, right? Yeah. And I, I, was, I was having a friend of mine read it who is a rabbi, and I asked him, what do Jews think about God changing? I'm making this argument in the book that God changes as a result of the experience of the crucifixion. And he said, of course God changes because yeah. love demands change. If one of the two beings in the love relationship were in stasis, that would not be love. Both partners need to be dynamic and ability to uh, able to change uh, yeah, as a result yeah. of the love relationship. Yeah. And God changed Genesis six verse six. He repented mm. to have created human beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, but in spite of this, he uh, remained faithful to his creation decision, mm -hmm. and this is the beginning of the pain of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He endures human beings full of sins and uh, violence and injustice. And, and is one of the reasons you say God does that, is, is that tied in? For me, I've made that connection in your theology with then the, the Jewish mystical teaching of Zimsum, of God's self-limitation to allow human beings to flourish but also to fail as God's kind of retreated enough to leave space for creation. Yeah. Yes, I, I got I, that I right. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Few, because I mean, there's like four chapters on that. I, 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 I don't do, know, but it's not every day you get Moltmann just say you got that. I right. I got it right. I just am glad I, you're like life the lesson. recording doesn't. But, I, yeah, please. I like uh, more and more special terms for God. Okay. Uh, I began with historical terms, this promise and time and future. And uh, so um, the broad place uh, is uh, an attractive uh, symbol of God for me. Mm. He is not the authority who uh, judges me but he is inviting me to Macomb, the broad place. Mm -hmm. Okay, on that note, yeah. I think one of the most challenging lines in this book is over is is some maybe not at odds with this. So you can you can sort this out for us because you know one of the um, one of the great subjective views of the atonement 
is Peter Abelard saying that God's love is revealed on the cross yeah. and it's like a magnet that draws us all into it. You write, <laughs> Christians who do not have the feeling that they must flee the crucified Christ have probably not yet understood him in a sufficiently radical way. I wonder what it is, when you wrote that line, what, what it is that you think that we, sh- we at least, if we see that crucified Christ, we at least consider fleeing. What confronts us that causes us to want to flee? The identification with the crucifixion, which is a dirty thing. Uh, like uh, an execution. And uh, it's a painful execution for hours and hours. Mm. And uh, so we should take the crucifixion seriously and not as a symbol for melting love, Mm. but every execution is dirty. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of execution, we're going to ask Jenny McBride, Professor Jenny McBride is going to come up here and join our uh, panel. My mom just texted me and said, congratulations for checking something off your bucket list. (laughs) I love you, Mom. Um, You two work together on an issue of great justice regarding an execution. And I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about that experience, Jenny, and and working with Professor Moltmann on that. Sure. Uh, Thank you. Um, It's, of course, an honor to be here um, on Homebrew Christianity and to be here next to Jürgen Moltmann, who has become a good friend over the years. Uh, I taught in a theology certificate program here in Atlanta with the four Protestant seminaries that are here. Um, a program that's housed at Emory University. And in it, I met Kelly Gissendanner, who was the only woman on Georgia's death row. I met her in 2010. She uh, was a part of this program, which was amazing for her because she had been in solitary confinement for her whole incarceration, and she was able to spend Fridays taking classes. Uh, One of the classes she took was with me, and it was a Theology Foundations class where we read Professor Moltmann's work, uh, especially A Theology of Hope and The Spirit of Life. So Kelly, uh, being who she is, uh, was so taken by his theology and by this idea of hope and learning about hope in a new way that she asked me. She knew that I had a friendship with Jürgen and asked if uh, it would be appropriate for her to write him, to which I said, of course, knowing that he would, of course, write back in a beautiful friendship developed between them. Uh, when uh, Professor Moltmann was coming here to Atlanta in 2011 for a um, Reformation Day talk, he asked if I would take him to visit Kelly. And so we quickly scrambled together and decided we'd have our whole graduation uh, ceremony around this time where he spoke and Kelly spoke, and then the three of us had a two-hour pastoral visit together. Dr. Moltmann, can you Tell us what that experience was like for you to meet Kelly, uh, having corresponded with her by email. I mean, by mail, by letter. Yeah, by letter. Yeah, you don't do email. I know this (laughs) for a fact. (laughs) I want to have my rest. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, She developed a real hunger for theology. Hmm. She spoke. Uh, it's a commencement day uh, in prison uh, about it. And uh, she uh, changed from a bitter and disappointed woman to a open-minded and uh, warm-hearted person. And uh, she developed a strong belief in Christ, Uh, though she felt the burden 
of guilt uh, more and more, but her belief was stronger. Mm. And uh, in December last year, she wrote about the date of execution in February, and I sent her my handkerchief and wrote, when the tears are coming, take my handkerchief. Mm. Mm. And she was very moved by this gesture. Well, the state of Georgia executed her three times. Three times she was waiting four hours in chains uh, for the execution. This is a cruelty unknown in the civilized world. You, you, you both, you both advocated for her to be reprieved of her death sentence and commuted to a life sentence. As, as theologians of hope, how do you maintain hope in the face of that failure to the state? Well, uh, let me add that uh, she developed a pastoral care in the women's prison mm-hmm. for her fellow prisoners uh, in an amazing way. Mm-hmm. He, she prevented some to commit suicide and uh, desperation and uh, the fellow prisoners uh, looked upon her and said if Kelly can stand this we can Mm. do it Mm. Mm. too Mm. so uh, my idea was to build her up for a pastoral counselor in prison Uh, the church in prison Uh, and uh, this would be a task for her for for the rest of her life Uh, she would have found a meaningful existence behind Park Royal but this was ended Um, I would say that uh, one of the main things that we learned by reading Theology of Hope together, Kelly and I, is um, a couple of things. One is the way you emphasize that biblical hope is a hope for this world. And secondly, that um, living in that hope is between uh, two tensions, uh, or is is a tension between two tensions false certainties, the, this false certainty that what we want to happen, um, which was clemency, definitely will happen. Surely God won't let this happen. And then the despair of saying what we don't want to happen will definitely happen. And I think for Kelly that um, I watched her live in that tension in an extraordinary way. Uh, right up until the very end, um, a lot was made in the media as it should have been about her final time where she would, um, was sobbing because she wanted to live this life with her children um, and with the ministry she had yeah. and keeping on studying theology. So she was sobbing for that um, and yet could also uh, seeing amazing grace and knowing where she was going into the loving arms of yeah. God. And I think for those of us, your question about um, sort of how to, to keep on in the face of this uh, Georgia death machine that just uh, acted again 24 hours ago um, is, uh, as, as Moltmann writes, living into, hope is living into the promises and possibilities of God. And so I saw Kelly's whole life and everything we were doing to try to save it as a witness to the gospel of, um, of hope and mercy and redemption. Um, so I think that this focus on hope also helped those of us that were, um, all of us that were 
in the movement gave us energy to keep going, especially in this, after the second death warrant, um, where things just felt different, um, but to keep, uh, to keep living into the promise of God. Um, and in that, as Professor Moltmann writes, you transform the present. And I think that we, we are seeing the present being transformed. And one of the last things Kelly said is, you know, she said, I don't believe that God is done with me and um, I want to keep living. And I believe that was true, too, that God was not done with her. And in the face of her death, I think that God is still not done with her story. Um, I did interviews uh, international interviews, uh, you know, all over the globe where her story is being told. And so I do believe that, um, that the death penalty will end eventually. And I'm going to be on the, uh, ca- the state capital, uh, or the U S um, capital steps when it happens, uh, thinking of Kelly. Yeah. Jürgen, how do, how do you, yeah, yeah. How do you th- maintain hope in the face of despair when it happens? As a protest. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're we're here celebrating the 40th anniversary of this book. Is there? Does this book? What What's the legacy of this book in your own mind and your spirit? Yeah. Well, Jurgen said earlier uh, that powerful image of um, the book of the crucified God falling off the bookshelf and John Sabrino's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, room and I have a similar image in my mind and actually a picture of it too that's on my desk of Jurgen signing the crucified God uh, for Kelly at that graduation ceremony and the power of that book and his presence and her presence inside that prison um, to me is just the perfect image uh, of what the crucified God is about. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me is how powerful that story is when the theologian connects their vocation to friendship and that so many of the abstract doctrines and stories we tell, you know, even a wonderful critique of the two persons nature, um, distracting us from the suffering of God and the divine life. But could you describe how you see as educators, as ministers or that vocation of theologians, friendship with individuals impacting or giving life to your your thought? Is this for me? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, absolutely. I um, I mean, the women that are in uh, the prison uh, here in Georgia are some of my best friends now. Um, I think when, you know, that can often happen in student teaching relationships when you're talking about these existential questions and these matters of life and death, and in the prison it's that much stronger. Um, and Kelly and I shared, um, talked theology. We talked about Jurgen's books th- literally through the cells of her bar after she, uh, bars of her cell, excuse me, after she um, was pulled from the program, we had to go to her on death row. Um, so that's a powerful image. But the other piece is, I think that um, just the fact that Jurgen and Kelly um, became such good friends is just a, a a gorgeous picture um, that they're actually very similar in a lot of ways. They um, both read the Bible in prison. They both served in the army. They both have really funny senses of humor. Um, and to watch these two people that in other ways seem like the most opposite people in the world have this beautiful friendship that I know changed Kelly and I think probably changed you as well. I'm very grateful to have known Kelly Gessendam. Thanks to you. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. And you're going. You want to invite your doctor Vater up? Ah, uh, well, um, yeah. D- did you want to ask the Iowa question? No, no. We're good, All right, okay. we're good on that. All right, Philip. Uh, Philip Clayton, who is who's my advisor, um, has uh, prepared a a, a a theological toast to Moltmann that anticipates the eschatological banquet. In which one's uh, beverages don't run dry, just like Jesus' first uh, sign in the Gospel of John. And uh, oh, and Mary Ann oh, from Phillips Theological Seminary uh, has beverages right here. And ironically, or serendipitously, uh, there is a Wild Heaven Craft Brewing Company here in Georgia who has a beer called the Eschaton. <laughs> oh. So, you know, I'm just, 
Phil needs one. If I don't mind drinking water, but you're more than allowed. But don't feel coerced. I don't want to ruin your witness. That's what Americans say. Germans have no idea what that means, right? You see this. <laughs> so is, is everyone prepared? I'm not sure that everyone has something to lift. Textbook, a coaster. Yeah, I mean, this is getting recorded and will be on the Internet. So there is uh, like 600 cans of beer. So you should probably use the restroom and grab another one at any point. Um, because uh, sharing is caring. So you need to know that a German toast um, is a single sentence and takes about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but since you don't speak German, I have broken it down, the one sentence, into a couple different parts and provided an English translation. Uh, it's fun to give a toast in two languages because... People, most of you won't be able to get me to catch me cheating on the translation. In fact, it's a blatant mistranslation, deconstruction. Or maybe I won't be massacring the translation. Maybe it's a creative rendering of the differences between German and American culture and theology. A difference between um, the Große Saule in Tübingen and homebrewed Christianity broadcasts. I'll say no more. So, um, how many people actually speak German who will be on to what I'm about to do? All right, so you're allowed to laugh, and Herr Moltmann will check. So, Herr Moltmann, Sie haben es geschafft, eine konstruktive christliche Auseinandersetzung mit der Philosophie und der Kultur zu führen, ohne die, Be die Bestimmtheit der christlichen Stimme zu verlieren. Translation. Herr Moltmann, when I look at your picture, it always reminds me of Sean Connery. Connery. <laughs> <laughs> Sie haben anerkannt die Tiefe der Herausforderungen, die uns entgegenkommen von der Philosophie, von der Wissenschaft, von anderen Religionen. Und sie haben es benutzt, die haben diese Unterschiede benutzt als Ressourcen für die christliche Theologie. Translation. You know, when you speak at Homebrewed, you're a rock star. Because uh, we think that guys with German accents are simply more intelligent than we are. And they must be closer to God. <laughs> the God um, that can be known is not the God himself. <laughs> and the God in Christ, that, that's even bigger than the other God. <laughs> Herr Moltmann, ich, würde das, ich möchte das Wort äh, Versöhnung benutzen. Sie haben die Spannungen zwischen verschiedenen Bereichen der Theologie versöhnt. Sie haben äh, kämpfende theologische Schulen versöhnt. Und ich erinnere mich daran, ähm, über die Versöhnung mit Herrn Pannenberg in München am Reformationstag in den 80er Jahren, ja. wo ich dabei war. Translation. We think it's great, Jürgen that you'd hang out at this homebrewed festival uh. and that you would allow us to toast and roast you and ask you questions and make you feel awkward and basically treat you like we treat our American professors. We think that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and in closing, also Herr Moltmann, mit Anerkennung und Verehrung in Freundschaft und tiefer Verbundenheit und mit großer Dankbarkeit zum Wohl. Translation. Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> to the coolest theologian we know <laughs> who has given amazing gifts to the church worldwide and to the growth of constructive systematic theology, 
To the theologian who is, as Tripp might say, freaking awesome, Jürgen, you rock. There you go, theology nerds. That was a sweet, zesty theology interview with Jürgen Moltmann. Um, as, as I told you before, I wanted to tell you uh, uh, two things. One, uh, the, the podcast gets done. I walk outside, and um, who's there? Who's there outside smoking a cigarette right after the homebrewed podcast? But Daryl, Glenn, and Rick from The Walking Dead. That's right. We're in Atlanta, so it's not surprising they're there filming the second half of the season. At this point, I did not know that Glenn was alive. So I walk outside, you know, all jazzed up, worked up, because I just got to talk to Jurgen Moltmann. I have endorphins flowing like crazy. Then who's there? But Glenn, with Daryl and Rick, I know they're filming the second half of the season. And I basically turn into like a middle school uh, girl who's like really into Taylor Swift. And then Taylor sends her one of those like Instagram videos like, hi, I'm glad you're born. It's your birthday. And then you like see the YouTube video of them just flipping a gasket. Well, it was like that, except I'm a grown adult. And I was just like, ah, Rick, Glenn, Daryl, ah, you're alive, Glenn. And they ran away. But it happened. And then I was made fun of by multiple people there for turning into a teeny bopper fan. Anyway, uh, this Christmas, the Give the Gift of Jesus has Christmas thing uh, for every person that you get my book for them this Christmas. Then just forward the receipt to bonus at tripfuller.com. And each, each one you buy, I will give you a little entry into a drawing for $500 worth of theology books. Like really sweet books. Like tons of different uh, theology texts that will fill up your bookshelf and just you'll have pages to enjoy all year long. Uh, Not only that, but for you, your friends, your reading group at church, uh, whoever it is you give the book to, you'll all get invited to a video interactive book study on the book led by moi. So you can uh, get on. I'll talk about part of the book. Then I'll answer questions, engage you via the video. And if you aren't there live, you'll obviously get the recording of it. But um, I'll be doing all that. So, you know, like, think about it. You don't want to have to do all the work for your your book your book group at church. I'll do it for you. You just all get the book. You have a you have your fundamentalist friend and they're like, I don't know if you're Christian. You and all your liberal ideas. Then you're like, guess what? It's Jesus' birthday and I'm giving you a book about Jesus and want you to talk about Jesus on the internet with me. Oh, I guess you might still have Jesus in your heart. And then 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 it's like a way to build bridges and friendship, you know what I mean? Um uh, Pete Rollins was uh, he was actually his idea he's like Trip, you need to do an online book group about your book because there are a lot of people listening to podcasts and you know your book kind of like brings them along and then they just need to take one more step and then agree with me and I'm like why would why would they do that once they understand how awesome Jesus is see so you want to figure out how that story goes because I'm, I'm going to explain to him this uh, Wednesday how wrong he is during the book group about his book And then he's going to come in to my book group, but I'm not going to have him tell me how wrong I am. I'm going to tell him, he's going to tell me how right I am. Yeah. I want to give him an opportunity to be uplifting and supportive and encouraging because he's really kind of angsty and downer all the time. And yeah. So to be on his, it's one of his growing edges. Yeah. You like that. All right. Anyway. Yeah, so uh, guess send all that, send send your uh, gifties of the book to bonus at tripfuller.com. You can go to homebrewedchristianity.com to get all the info. Um, it'll be there. And uh, yeah, that's all I got for now. Peace out. Coming up soon, more Moltmann uh, discussion on the podcast, plus lots of other things. Bye bye.